Hello, my darling, and welcome to today's story time. Today, we have another special surprise from our sponsor, Monster Ivy Publishing. They've given me the honor of reading the first chapter of The Girl at the Hanging Tree by Mary Gray. Monster Ivy's books are edgy but clean from a Christian worldview. Head on over to their website at monsterivy.com and check out their incredible catalog of authors. Thank you again to Monster Ivy for special access to the girl at the hanging tree. And now, on with our story time. Chapter 1 Consciousness hits me like a swift creek, rolling over smooth and jagged boulders. Hand on doorknob, back against door. It appears Tansy's decided it's time for me to take over. Salt and pepper shakers go to war in my arms, so I shake them out, grasp the nearest pillar. Looks like my altar has left me on the side porch this time. Settling my nerves, I remind myself once again of the few details I know. My name is Gemma Louise Cold Iron. I live in the Deep Creek, Texas, on the dead of a once thriving Main Street. Home is here, a boarded up Victorian with a cupola and an iron fence that keeps everybody out. Tansy remembers everything that happened in our past, while I can barely remember much of anything. My job is to go out to fetch food every two weeks. Of course, I'd like to come out more than that, but I do understand why Tansy never leaves. She has an extreme fear of the outside world and spends all her time drawing, painting, and embroidering pictures of dead bodies. Glancing over my shoulder, I find that the second nearest pillar says our house number is still 199. The holly bushes continue to be a mile high, and our cracked footpath expertly leads guests away from the house to the largest of our no-trespassing signs. Tourists like to stop by to take pictures of the house, but we do any and all things to keep them away. Pansy says they give her a migraine. Well, I'd better get going if I'm going to get my hair done and shop before I return home by 6.30. Hopefully the store still has Tansy's favorite, split pea soup and lemon chamomile tea. It only takes me a few seconds to trot down our path and find the key beneath a palm-sized rock under the gate. A pokey iron fence digs into my hand, but it doesn't take long to lift the corner of the rock and unearth the key. I jiggle it into the padlock, which pops open. Sure, I could bring the key with me, but Tansy worries I might lose it. So I slip the key back under the rock, click the gate closed, and mostly close the lock. Starting to the road, I drink in the sun, never more hungry for exercise. Tansy may have bad knees, but I'm able to shake them out well enough, loosen my ligaments and joints. Once I reach the railroad tracks, the grackles and I fly. A newer, white-pillared mansion hunches on the left. The funeral home lurks like a bad omen to the right. The pink granite courthouse is just ahead, and with its numerous towers and arches, It's probably another relic from the late 19th century. I jaunt past a sculpture of a pair of giant metal dice while the clock tower on the courthouse bellows out three rings. PM already. Looks like I should have just enough time to finish my run, do my hair, and get the groceries. My sneakers fit like armored socks. Pink running shorts brush the goose flesh on my skin mid-thigh. I probably look like any average woman on a run, but I tend to memorize every detail 
in case it goes away. I love the wreath-adorned windows. My, how the red, white, and blue Texas flags flap so jubilantly. The wood smoke wafting over the square could only come from sweetie pie ribeyes, and the pinstriped candy canes in front of hay sugar remind me that their truffles are more dangerous than knives. Three Victorian houses bow like old friends from the north end of the square, alternately painted red, blue, and green. Of course, the hair lounge, back by hay sugar, is where I'm headed once I'm finished running. Tansy's idea of grooming is adorning our head with a crown of roses without brushing once, or even washing. I sincerely hope she hasn't been sleeping with the cats again and gifted us with fleas. Millwood, with its red brick and stone facade, seems to be waving for me to come over, but I tend to avoid the mental health facility. By the time I've finished my three or so miles, I stumble into the hair lounge, covered in sweat and stinky enough to sidetrack a wolverine. Luckily, hair product is a way of covering that up, and Francesca, my hairstylist, is too nice ever to bat an eye. They're putting in a taco joint. Francesca shimmies back and forth while singing in her rich, alto voice. Squeezing me with her muscular arms, she hugs me like I'm a long, lost relative, or a serial killer she really wants to see die. Calming shea butter lotion wafts off her umber skin, sending me off to a Caribbean beach, releasing me from her iron-clad crib. Francesca sashays over to her hair-cutting chair, stomps on the foot pedal. It's about time we got a restaurant with food that's not barbecue or fried. Not about to argue, I take a seat. Back in Atlanta, this cute little doggeria was my go-to place. After a long day, I'd get me fixed up with one of their bean and jalapeno burritos. Mm -hmm. You sure you don't want to go back to Josie's? I wink while she cloaks me with her slick nylon cape. The cape goes on a bit tight. Not that I blame Francesca. Josie's was recently shut down after employees put Miralax on their pizza. Mmm. Don't you go harassing me, Missy. Humor alights my good friend's eyes until the moment I tug the elastic from my pony. And both of us set our sights on the undead creature in the mirror. Long, dark hair streams down a woman's face. Jet black circles rim her eyes. Her skin's so pale, you can call her Dracula's cousin and the whole town would be on board for a reenactment, county-wide. I suppose this sickly, twenty-five-ish creature is me, though it's a tad hard to believe. I'd rather grab a kayak and float down to the Trinity River than be a potted plant sitting indoors all day. What is clear is that, once again, Tansy's failed to brush or wash our hair since our last visit, not to mention the thick, almost black caterpillar growing over our eyes. Francesca staggers backward. Her enormous eyes canvas all 360 degrees of my hair monstrosity. Gemma Louise, now what you go and do? Stick your head in a turbine. I'm a deep sleeper. I tug a lingering rose petal from my hair, and I like running. But, Francesca tentatively dabs at my hair with her palms, like she's been asked to wrangle a dead porcupine. It looks like you've been trying to tangle it for weeks. The back of my head gets itchy, and I reach up to scratch it, when Francesca gives me the evil eye. I drop my hand. Best not exacerbate the point. Nothing. She plants her feet shoulder-width apart and cups her chin with her hand, clearly trying to think how to help me. Nodding once, twice, she seems to decide everything at once when she says, Don't you worry, baby. She glances around, like we've been surrounded by World War II soldiers, 
and it's time to head to the bunker, ASAP. Hair products pile in her arms, including a detangler, tweezers, and about 30 different wax products before she lifts her chin to the back row of sinks. Ready? I follow without question. No more Dracula's cousin. Whoop, whoop. Or even that seedy girl from the ring. And this, my darling, ends our story time for today. Make sure and visit monsterivy.com to read the rest of this story. The Girl at the Hanging Tree. As always, I hope that you have very sweet and creepy dreams. Good night.